The LIVE project, as established within architecture universities, improves students' exposure to hands-on and career-ready skills through design-build construction. However, as a result of increasing connectivity, a new model of LIVE project participation has emerged, whereby international volunteers, participants, are invited to engage in design-build architecture education abroad, independent of university course structures. As distinct from conventional volunteer abroad construction in the humanitarian development sector, this independent model of architecture education abroad represents a unique intersection between the LIVE project and new spatial agency. However, despite the increasingly participatory nature of LIVE projects, there is still a lack of research into the role stakeholder participation plays in the first place. This is situated within a wider lack of participation definition within design research in general. As a counter narrative to formalize education and university course structures, and in line with calls for departure from traditional understandings of participation in an era of globalization. This presentation delineates temporal lenses for examining participation, draws on three case study projects in Lebanon, Fiji and Nepal to contextualize this emerging spatial agency, and highlights key significances that exist for temporal lenses use in live project inquiry. Before exploring these emerging live projects abroad, it is first necessary to understand the spatial conditions from where the spatial agency came to offer a baseline for its exploration. Articulating evolving global conditions offers us this baseline. Globalization's intersection with the traditional craft of design and other evolving fields has given rise to new opportunities for understanding how people interact, a fertile space for architectural understanding. This has resulted in the emergence of a new independent space for architectural study, the potential for individuals to participate in architecture initiatives, independent of previous bureaucratic institutions and class structures. In the early 2000s, famed sociologist Sigmund Bowman identifies important properties of what we consider modernity and chronologically separates it into two groups, solid modernity and liquid modernity. Solid modernity's defining feature can be said to be the organization of human activity and institutions along bureaucratic lines. Social, political and economic changes are relatively ordered, stable and predictable, and existed as such for some time. However, it is a recently emerged form of liquid modernity that articulates the current climate, referring to a global condition of continuous fluctuations and change. With the development of trans and multinational corporations resulting in a further decentering of state authority, nation states no longer exist as key load bearing structures of society, but a network of individuals and instrumentalities. People no longer need to go through a formal institution or bureaucratic entity to build projects internationally but can build on networks in the digital age to formalize their own grassroots architectural practices with varying degrees of independence from regulatory bodies. What started as small-scale cooperation has grown to become sequences of open production and collaborative innovative practices. It is this increase in opportunities for collaboration independent of institutions that serves as a distinct pivot point in understanding architecture education beyond traditional frameworks. If architecture as a discipline is a function within this globalized context, it is necessary to understand what it means to participate in this increasing complexity. True to the intersectionalist nature of architecture, by illuminating the intersections of emerging architectures and other domains of knowledge, what it means for architecture to participate or enable participation can be harnessed. How we look at time is called a temporal lens. The underlying temporal lenses that are used to operationalize research are critical and must be made explicit. The relationship between temporal lenses and participation is increasingly discussed in research in recent years, especially in the formalized field of participation, participatory design, and its relevance to other disciplinary fields. These fields include organizational studies, ethnographic studies and anthropology, and interaction design. However, a comparatively small amount of literature exists for the relevance of temporal lenses in architectural research beyond conventional post-occupancy evaluation. Participatory architecture as a formal knowledge domain already stems from links created by the participatory design field. To extend our knowledge of participation in architecture, it's fitting to refer to the same routes being progressed. Following special issue review of participatory design literature, Saad Sullinan et al. provide a noteworthy foundation for the use of temporal lenses in understanding how participation unfolds across time. They offer five temporal lenses to enable this formal understanding. 
the phasic, momentary, retrospective, prospective, and long-term lenses. Whilst it's beyond the scope of the presentation to fully interrogate this literature, these lenses can be summarized and we can begin building a preliminary overview of the respective suitabilities for ongoing live project research. The phasic lens, as used in mainstream architecture and urban planning, is focused on identifying, describing, and reflecting upon different cycles of participation or participatory activity over time. Certain techniques and methods are a better fit for earlier, middle, or later stages in a sequential design process. Whilst all architecture projects can be considered phasic by their project stages, the research of architecture projects is not necessarily. The phasic lens in research is very much subject to structures of institutional processes and planning and can be considered most appropriate for industry regulated development. Whilst not negating the practical benefits of a phasic research lens, some structural tensions do exist between it and a live project's abroad context, the latter representing a decentralized, less regulated and rhizomatic evolutionary discourse. The emergent lens understands participation as dynamic, plural and a fluidly unfolding phenomenon presupposing a condition for design researchers' reflexivity. Locating the researcher in the here and now, participation is not structured for chronological phases, but instead always in negotiation, with continuous engagement and reflexivity in the moment, to feed back into the dynamic interrelationships of forces as they unfold or emerge over time. This echoes the ancestral design build programs of the Bauhaus in Germany or the Mass in Russia, whereby practice is encouraged to be concentric as opposed to sectional with an emphasis on relations. Through engaging in self-reflexivity, the research can be contextualized in the researcher's own cultural background and further aid in recognizing the researcher's voice in the research product. As acknowledged by Alsop and Rittenhofer, this contextual reflexivity that warrants a subjectivist epistemology for the interrelationship between researcher and participant is especially necessitated when pursuing research in a country different than the researcher's own, fundamental to complexly relational context that is live projects abroad. Inspired by the retrospective studies of participatory projects, the retrospective lens is based on looking back and understanding and interpreting how participation changes after a project has ended or surpassed a certain period of time. By retrospectively assessing participation in one or many projects, this lens can be combined with a phasic lens or inform future projects via long-term lens. This lens includes elements of evaluation and is arguably the closest lens to current formats of post-occupancy evaluations. Structured studies that measure buildings' effects on productivity and well-being after they've been inhabited. Whilst these formalized retrospections are already under practice in the mainstream architecture industry, use of such formalized practices by decentralized live project initiatives remain even more unclear and those that do would surely set themselves apart. To date, stakeholder participation in architecture has been typically conceived and assessed at the front stage of the design process, and viewed as being contained in some form within project and design schedules. Brand's publication How Buildings Learn attests to this, and traces the evolution of buildings and how buildings adapt to changing requirements across time. Within this, he raises issue with the tendency of architects to conceive buildings as fixed in time. This is in contrast to interior designers and urban planners who often think in terms of churn, echoing the cyclical nature of the built environment as perceived through the phasic lens. The prospective lens extends beyond these boundaries, considering that participation can be sustained or emerged in a post-project future. Whilst positioned in a future dimension, it is applied before or during a project to lay the infrastructure for future action, artifacts and systems. This lens carries considerable opportunity in community and development projects, of which extant literature has noted an overemphasis of front-end participation, and indicating that further research beyond this limited scope is required. And finally, the long-term lens stretches the view of participation, looking back, forward, and to the present, taking into account both the past and the future in the present. This view frames participation as not strictly phasic or emergent, but processual, whereby otherwise established boundaries are blurred between design, use, implementation, maintenance, redesign, and repair. Whilst this lens represents arguably the biggest research gap of all five lenses, owing to its scale as well as only recent presence in literature, by the same token it can be said to carry the most potential in its use and application. Research through this lens makes room for different temporal scales and design. As posited by Dainty, 
and methodological pluralism can be embraced for the yielding of deeper insights into under-researched sectors, of which architecture live projects abroad is one. Synonymous with the iteratively constructed nature of the live project architecture itself, this infrastructure further echoes the calls for departure from traditional understandings of participation in an era of globalization. Volunteer-based live projects abroad, as physical manifestations within this independent space of liquid modernity, offer a useful frame of reference to understand how this global participation unfolds. Following design-build participation in Lebanon, Fiji and Nepal, research into their built architecture projects can help bridge the gap between abstract global conditions and measurable research investigation into the subject of participation. The temporal lenses outlined can yield different research approaches in assessing the different project contexts. As a starting point for this intersection, we can first offer an introductory insight into these built projects. One such live project initiative abroad is MEDS, Meeting of Design Students, an independent and voluntary network run by and for interdisciplinary design students and recent graduates. Revolving around two-week design build workshops in a different country each year, it accommodates up to 250 international design participants across 12 plus design-based projects ranging in scale from small pavilions down to graphic design and photography. MED's workshop of summer 2018 was hosted in Bibwas, Lebanon. All 16 projects of the workshop that year aimed to serve as interventions to activate underutilized public space in Bibwas city. Whilst it is beyond the scope of this presentation to outline all 16 projects of the two-week workshop that year, a summary overview can be seen here. We can, however, look at one sample project in some detail. The Sliding Chapel project, as featured on the publications platform ArcDaily, was one of the 15 projects cried out at MED's workshop in August 2018. My personal role in MED's Lebanon was the surveying role of multiple projects as my first case study, and the Sliding Chapel is a focus part of this overview. This was constructed with 14 participants and one tutor. Constructed as a non-denominational space for contemplation, the Sliding Chapel sits on an archaeological conservation site at the Lebanese coast framing a view out to sea. Assembled from upcycled timber pallets, the chapel sits on top of a prefabricated steel frame. Using the traditional Japanese shu sugi ban burning technique, the timber was charred as a way of treating it, tying three boards into a chimney and setting fire at the base. The workshop started with the arrival of over 200 international design participants from across Europe and beyond, 14 of which were sliding chapel project participants and constructed the built elements in an abandoned beer bottling factory for later assembly on site. On site construction happened in the latter half of the workshop at the Lebanese coast. This process is what gave rise to the final construction. In keeping with grassroots and design build architecture abroad, the process of the sliding chapel encompassed a wide range of adaptations, some of which can be seen here. A second volunteer based live project initiative is Cock and Studio a network of architectural students and graduates who work in a variety of design and construction projects worldwide. Calkins' working practice aims to address social, environmental and economical issues through well-crafted design collaboration, through active participation between local communities and international student volunteers. This is primarily through large-scale construction over a period of months each year. Their name is derived from the origins of the founding members, young architecture graduates from Canada, UK and Indonesia. One case project example is a live project construction of a coconut oil refinery on Batiki Island in Fiji. Three hours by boat off the eastern coast of Fiji's mainland, Batiki Island's population of 300 inhabit four villages, Mua, Yavu, Munuku and Aigani. This is where my second case study project took place. The coconut oil refinery aimed to allow the co-op Bula Batiki to centralise their ongoing processing of local coconut oil, relieve their previous use of the village hall which wasn't optimised for such process, and attain higher food safety standards to increase the scope for their regional and international sales. This was constructed by international students and graduates alongside members of the local Bula Batiki co-op and village community. The design had three main drivers, portal frame construction, phase design completion, and the virgin coconut oil linear production process. The project construction was two months and took place from July to September 2019. Each project participant was hosted by a family in Yavu, from where we walked to the site at the village perimeter each morning. After two weeks of site clearance with axes, machetes and one chainsaw, the first delivery of timber was brought to the Fijian government's cargo ship beyond the reef, from where project materials were transported by Yavu members' boats to the shore edge adjacent to the site. Following string lines and sharpened branches from the island bush, 
450 mm square and 600 mm deep holes were dug for subsequent concrete footings, within which timber logs enveloped in plastic membrane, bin liner, were cast. It may also be acknowledged that all rebar profiles were bent by hand with a pipe. Following laminating the portal frames being stacked out nearby, the frames are raised, laid to rest on the notched posts, where they are braced together and bolted through. This enabled our own scaffolding to be assembled, enabling facade substructures, diagonal bracing, stud walls, roof structure, internal and external cladding, mosquito netting, concrete slab with chainsawed log formwork, and many other elements to be carried out to completion. The intermittent sharing of the external cladding bears reference to the inspiration the team took from the traditional mat weaving done all across Fiji, particularly the offset nature of the specific Batiki Island pattern. A third live project initiative is EAHR, Emergency Architecture and Human Rights, who aim to generate social, economic and environmental change by building resilience in people and communities. Founded in Copenhagen, Denmark, the EAHR organization works and builds in accordance with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Through various humanitarian construction in Europe, Africa, the Middle East, South America and Asia, their work includes projects that enable participation by volunteering architecture graduates and practitioners, hand in hand with employed local workers and community partners on the ground. A case project by EHR is the pavilion reconstruction of a patti. A patti is an architectural typology of a multi-purpose community infrastructure in traditional Navari settlements. This took place in Kisipidi, a small historical village located 13 kilometers from Kathmandu city in Nepal. Following the Gorkha earthquake in Nepal in 2015, the Nepali organization Lumanti, support group for shelter, led the recovery plan of Kisipidi and helped coordinate the project construction that took place from August to December 2019. This ended with a 13-day period for volunteering architecture graduates and practitioners to participate alongside the already ongoing community building. The design of the Pati Pavilion is octagonal in plan, with the triangulated timber frame primary structure that blossoms. This is achieved with cross-bracing tapered H-frames that radiate from a void in the roof, centred for the incorporation and preservation of the tree on site. Situated on steel plates with concrete footings, these load points, cast in situ with the concrete foundation, established the geometry in which the herringbone patterned brick plinth was based, following the washing of stones as part of the local Kisipiti culture before returning them to the ground. A stone foundation was laid in between the perimeter marked out by the cast concrete footings. These stones were then packed with gravel and soil, finished with brick dust brushed in between the laid bricks themselves. Navigating evolved budgetary restrictions, the primary structure realised a global-local intersection of cross-cultural exchange and established a frame for a future completion of the roof using the local Shingati tiling technique. Each of these initiatives represents a different model of participation with different stakeholders across different scales, context, space and time. However, each of these projects are unified under a definition of live project and the result of a distinct set of case study selection criteria I used for my research in the first place. As distinct from conventional volunteer broad construction in the humanitarian development sector, they represent a distinct and emergent typology of live project, beyond the boundary of the university structure. Participation in these types of volunteer-based live projects brings with it two unique conditions, an exposure to contextual conditions that the mainstream architecture industry is not, and a proportional lack of research investigation that university-based live projects would typically bring. These two conditions create a considerable knowledge gap of these decentralized live project initiatives. Together, they validate formal research investigation being carried out to address this knowledge gap, specifically that of stakeholder participation as outlined at the beginning. In summary, this presentation has outlined temporal lenses that can be used in formal research inquiry, offered an introductory insight into ongoing PhD research in emerging architecture initiatives, and has begun to articulate key significances that validate compatibility with the live project research on the subject of participation. Whilst this presentation is simply an introduction to ongoing research and current discourse, the significance of temporal lenses and formal research must not be overlooked. In much the same way that live projects remove students from the design studio vacuum and push boundaries of context, scale and participatory understanding, Temporal lenses and formal research can push boundaries of how we come to understand this understanding in the first place. Further research is underway by me to verify the respective temporal lenses suitability through a post-project evaluation of the case study projects presented. Amidst the broader topographies of architecture, spatial agency, transformation of higher education spaces, and challenges and opportunities for emerging career trajectories, 
The ongoing research aims to make an original contribution to understanding participation in such emerging architecture discourse, to extend current knowledge of how participation in these live projects operate, inform participation for both the organisations and communities within future initiatives, and to offer an empirical basis to broader participatory conditions of an emerging architectural space. Thank you. Thank you.